Philo's Jesus refers to an argument put forward by mythicists, and originally due to Dr. R. Carrier, that holds that there was a Jewish celestial figure of worship called Jesus who predated the life of Jesus as understood by historicists. If true, that would be a powerful argument. But is it true? The argument comes from two texts, the Old Testament minor prophet Zechariah and Philo of Alexandria's book on the confusion of tongues. The claim connection between them is that they both contain similar versions of the line Here is the man whose name is East. The similarity is not immediately obvious in English translations because the same Greek word Anatoly is translated as East in Philo's work and Branch in Zechariah. This is the passage from Philo. For there is a twofold kind of dawning in the soul, the one of a better sort, the other of a worse. That is the better sort when the light of virtue shines forth like the beams of the sun, and that is the worse kind when they are overshadowed and the vices show forth. Now the following is an example of the former kind. And God planted a paradise in Eden towards the east, not of terrestrial but of celestial plants, which the planter caused to spring up from the incorporeal light which exists around him. I have also heard one of the companions of Moses having uttered such a speech as this, Behold, a man whose name is the East. A very novel appellation indeed if you consider it as spoken of a man who is composed of body and soul, but if you look upon it as applied to that incorporeal being who in no respect differs from the divine image, you will then agree that the name of the East has been given to him with great felicity. For the father of the universe has caused him to spring up as the eastern sun, whom, in another passage, he calls the firstborn. And he who is thus born, imitating the ways of his father, has formed such and such species, looking to his archetypal patterns. And here is the passage from Zechariah 6. And the word of the Lord came to me. Take from the exiles Heldiah, Tobijah and Jediah, who have arrived from Babylon, and go the same day to the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah. Take from them silver and gold, and make a crown, and set it upon the head of Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. And say to him, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, for he shall grow up in his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. It is he who shall build the temple of the Lord, and shall bear royal honour, and shall sit and rule upon his throne. And there shall be a priest by his throne, and peaceful understanding shall be between them both. And the crown shall be in the temple of the Lord as a reminder to Heldiah, Tobijah, Jedediah, and Josiah, the son of Zephaniah. And those who are far off shall come and help to build the temple of the Lord, and you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. And this shall come to pass, if you will diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. So the translations of the Greek word Anatoly do differ in these two passages, with Philo given as east and Zechariah given as branch. It can also be translated as bud, sunrise or rising. But the originals in Philo who wrote in Greek and the Septuagint, which is the Greek version of the Old Testament that Philo favoured, use the same word. This differing translation is not an accident. The original ancient word did carry different meanings, and the meaning chosen reflects the context of the two passages. There is a similar linguistic issue concerning the names Jesus and Joshua in Zechariah. They were the same name in Aramaic. Joshua was translated into Greek as Yeshu, then into Latin as Jesus, and finally into English as Jesus. But Zechariah in the Greek Septuagint and the original Greek New Testament use the same Greek word. So the Philo's Jesus argument holds that these two passages are talking about the same person. That person is called both Yeshu or Jesus and Anatoly or East or Rising. And also has various other Jesus-like attributes, such as is the firstborn son of God from Philo and will build a temple to the Lord, bear royal honour, sit and rule upon the throne, etc. from Zechariah. Philo died around 50 AD and on the confusion of tongues probably dates from somewhere towards the end of the first half of the first century AD. The book of Zechariah dates itself to 520 to 518 BC during the reign of Darius, shortly after the Babylonian exile and before the building of the second temple, 
which according to Ezra was in 516 BC. So if this is all true, we have a reference to somebody who looks very like a celestial Jesus over 500 years before his earthly appearance. So what's the problem? Well, there are many serious problems. To start with, is Philo really quoting from Zechariah? The link between the two passages is not something mythicists have come up with. It's long been debated by scholars and there are problems. Philo doesn't make many quotes from the prophets, and when he does in other cases he always says he's quoting from the prophets. Furthermore, his preferred source for the Tanakh or Old Testament was the Greek Septuagint, and his wording is similar to but not the same as that in the Septuagint. Also, he tells us what his source was, and it wasn't Zechariah. He says, I have also heard from one of the companions of Moses having uttered such a speech as this. I'm not sure what he means by companion of Moses. This seems to be a person who is speaking contemporary with Philo, so possibly a Jew of his acquaintance. Comment below if you know who it is. The wording of the two passages is, however, pretty similar. This leads me to suspect that either Philo got it indirectly from Zechariah via a third party, or they both got the idea from a common source. And if either of these are the case, the connection with Jesus is tenuous, as we'll see. If, mindful of these objections, it is accepted that Philo is quoting Zechariah, there is the further problem that Zechariah does not seem to be equating Joshua the son of Jehozadak with the one called Anatoly or Branch. Zechariah 6 says, and the word of the Lord came to me, then goes on in verse 11, Take from them silver and gold, and make a crown, and set it upon the head of Joshua the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. And say to him, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, the man whose name is Branch, for he shall grow up in his place, and he shall build the temple to the Lord. So it's immediately doubtful that Mr. Branch and Joshua are the same person, because Zechariah is being commanded to tell Joshua to behold the man whose name is Branch, and it seems unlikely that Joshua was being told to behold himself. These two are also mentioned in Zechariah 3. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, O Satan, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was standing before the angel clothed in filthy garments, and the angel said to those who were standing before him, Remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with rich apparel. And I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord was standing by. And the angel of the Lord enjoined Joshua, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If you will walk in my ways and keep my charge, then you shall rule my house and have charge of my courts, and I will give you the right of access among those who are standing here. Hear now, O Joshua the high priest, you and your friends who sit before you, for they are men of good omen. Behold, I will bring my servant the branch, for behold, upon the stone which I have set before Joshua, upon a single stone with seven facets, I will engrave its inscription, says the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the guilt of this land in a single day. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, every one of you will invite his neighbour under his vine and under his fig tree. So the angel of the Lord says to Joshua and his friends, Behold, I will bring my servant the branch. In other words, watch and I'll bring Mr. Branch. Again suggesting that Joshua is not Mr. Branch. Most commentators on Zechariah are of course either Christian or Jewish and both groups agree that this reference to the branch is a prophecy about the Messiah. Christians think it's about the Messiah of the New Testament whereas Jews consider it to be about the awaited Messiah. But no one seems to conflate the branch with Joshua. To my mind, at least, these objections add up to a likelihood that Philo was not referring to a heavenly character called Jesus. And that seriously undermines the argument, particularly as without the name Jesus, the argument's powerful soundbite is lost. But even if the branch and Joshua are not the same, the words do still appear close together, which seems rather a coincidence. 
and it isn't the only coincidence relevant to the argument. Paul gives us the earliest picture we have of Jesus, and there are many parallels between Paul's Jesus and Zechariah. For example, Zechariah's branch is the firstborn son of God, the heavenly high priest, and the word Anatoly can be interpreted as rising, suggestive of the rising Jesus. Philo's theology was centred on his concept of the Logos, and there are also many parallels between Paul's Jesus and Philo's Logos, the very word Logos being applied to Jesus later in the Gospel of John. Similarly, Philo's Logos was given authority over the earth by God, was the image of God, and was the agent of God who made the earth. The argument goes that these parallels are so numerous that it is very unlikely that they arose by chance, and therefore they must reflect an earlier prehistoric Jesus figure. I would agree that these parallels are too numerous to be easily explicable by random chance, but the prehistoric mythical Jesus figure is not the only explanation. A more obvious one, in the case of Zechariah, is that the early Christians considered Zechariah to be prophecy about Jesus, and therefore it's hardly surprising that the figure of Jesus evolved to accord with him. In the case of Philo, the parallels between him and Paul have received considerable scholarly attention. Philo and Paul both believed that God is transcendent, whereas man is trapped within his body on earth. Their solution to the problems this causes were similar, with Christ being the key in Paul and the Logos being the key in Philo. Philo's Logos and Paul's Christ appear to be timeless. Both Philo and Paul were strongly dualist. They were both Hellenised diaspora Jews wrestling with the same theological problems from the same texts. They were contemporary, with Philo being about 20 years older than Paul, but we have no evidence that they ever met. This all being the case, multiple parallels between the two come as no surprise and do not require to us invoke the idea of a pre-first century AD figure of worship that they were both aware of to explain these commonalities. So what is Philo talking about? He's talking about two kinds of dawning of the soul, one good and one bad. With the good one, the light of virtue shines forth like the beams of the sun, and in the bad kind, the sunlight is overshadowed and vices show. He gives an example of the good kind. God planted a paradise in Eden towards the east, of a celestial kind that came from incorporeal light. Philo also heard companions of Moses refer to a man called East, which he found rather an odd name if given to a man, but he found to make perfect sense for something incorporeal. So who is this incorporeal man connected with this incorporeal Garden of Eden? It's not really very difficult. He is an Adam, who is associated by Philo with the Logos. So now let's consider what probably happened here. One possibility, and although I personally don't favour it, it is a possibility, is that there was a pre-first century celestial being called Jesus, with the properties identified above, who was worshipped first and then developed the fictional earthly narrative that we recognise today. All trace of the earlier belief was expunged from the record by the medieval Christian church, but they missed this trace in Zechariah and Philo. The other possibility is that this pre-first century celestial Jesus figure is a really big deal to mythicists. Such a figure, coupled with the silence of Paul, is going to convince a lot of people that they're right. And they have searched for him as feverishly as the medieval church may have searched for heresy. Only they have the internet. As so often happens, they searched so hard they found what they were looking for. But if you strip away the over-eager mythicist spin, what you find is nothing more than you would expect by random chance when trawling through extensive ancient sources for that elusive nugget. This gives an alternative explanation for the coincidence that the branch and Joshua appear close together in Zechariah, even if they're not referring to the same person. Joshua was a common name, and this is indeed a coincidence, but not unexpected given the volume of text being examined for parallels. In other words, the argument holds that the proximity of the words was caused by the pre-first century mythical Jesus belief. The counter is that the argument is caused by the proximity of the words. So does the argument favour historicity or mythicism? Well, the mythicist interpretation of these texts is certainly possible. And if true, it would strongly favour mythicism, 
whereas the historicist interpretation, though more lightly, seems pretty neutral. However, there is more. The mythicists have spent thousands of hours of diligent and motivated effort to find this early celestial Jesus. If this is the best they've come up with, we can be pretty damn sure there isn't anything better in the record.